Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with longtime environmental activist, lawyer, water expert, uh, Denise Fort, who is now Emeritus Professor of Law and Research at the University of New Mexico, to talk about the state of water management in our state and in the American West. Uh, Denise recently retired as the director of the Utten Transboundary Research Center at UNM. Among other of her roles um, is that she was also the former chair of the Western Water Policy Review Advisory Commission. Uh, it's just a real honor and a delight to have you here. I've been a big admirer of yours for a long, long time and learned an awful lot from you. Hope to learn more today. Great to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, last month, you and I uh, uh, were on a panel together on uh, water and cultural issues at the annual meeting of the Society of Applied Anthropology in Albuquerque down in, uh, in, uh, in Old Town. And that, at that time, um, when, when you gave your introductory remarks, uh, you said that you that now was the time to take off the gloves about water management in our state, and uh, I would love you to sort of explore that a little bit and say what that means and throw a punch or two, and then we'll okay. move down the row and talk about other things. There's so many good, smart people in New Mexico who are working on water, but I I think we're mostly looking at water as in in and in, in the environment and, and looking at the changes that are coming to the state we're looking at them in an incremental way and what i think we need to do instead is to jump forward you know look look at 100 years from now we're told that the temperature is going to be 10 degrees warmer we're going to told we're told that there's going to be half the amount of water delivered to elephant butte that there is now there's going to be you know we we've got varying estimates but 20 to 30 uh, percent less in some of the major river systems in the west so if we jump ahead and we think this this is what's coming then I don't think we take the same sorts of steps that the, that that all the good people who are looking at water are proposing taking now. I think I think we have to take really a, a fundamentally different approach. I think we need to change the paradigm. And I say that with all respect to all the sure. the good smart people who were working and, and working on on particular problems in particular places. But um, to, to give one example with with respect, um, I, the, talk, the thing I talked about in our our conference, look, looking at a proposed project on Ute Lake, where the state has come up, or the people in the region and the state has endorsed a half a billion dollar project to take water from Ute Lake and distribute it by pipeline to pe pipelines to people who live in that eastern New Mexico area. Well, we know that we're, we're mining the groundwater in that area basically to support the agriculture that goes into the dairy farms. So we're producing lots and lots of dried milk solids and other dairy products, and we're shipping them out of state. We're exporting our water. We're, we're taking fossil groundwater, and we're exporting it to other states. And then we're telling the Congress, we'd like you to give us, oh, $400 million or just something, you know, some, some little minor amount of money so that you can build this project to take water from Ute Lake. Meanwhile, we know that the Canadian River is affected by climate change. There was, you know, it, had we not had fortuitous rains at the end of last summer, yeah the Ute Lake would be drawn far down. And, you know, you put all these things together, you go, what are we doing? We can't, you know, we're, we're doing things that are fundamentally unsustainable. We're mining groundwater. We're looking at lots of energy to move water around. The water, in, in, in very strong possibility, the water won't be there to take from the Canadian River. So somebody's got to say, it, it, let, let's stop. Let's, let's look ahead at the future that's coming to us because of climate change. Um, and, and ask what sorts of changes do we have to make in our relationship to the land and our relationship to water so that we can actually have sustainable communities 100 years from now. I think you're completely right. Um, I think we're looking at things as if it was the 19th century. Uh, but what does, what does a, what are the basic outlines of a new paradigm, of, a, of something that will actually be sustainable in 100 years? And how do we think how do we wrap our heads around that kind of stuff and move toward it? That's, of course, the hardest question. I, I think with respect to our fossil groundwater, 
um, which we are depleting across the state. We don't have good information about the degree to which we're doing so, but we know that it's it's not sustainable to be pumping groundwater that's essentially not recharged. I think we know that it's it's not. Um, with respect to agriculture overall, that this is the hardest thing to think about, and it's, it's a hard thing to say, but with the warmer surface temperatures, um, with declining groundwater level, levels and so much at the state, with, with um, less surface water that's available, I think that we're going to have to look at agriculture, which may, might use about 80% of the water that's withdrawn within the state, and ask what's, what should be the future, what kind of social transitions are necessary for the people who are in, involved in agriculture at this time? How do we make that um, transitions that are, that are not injurious to them? But know that it's going to be changing in the future. And and all that said, of course, uh, you know, ev everyone's a fan of local food production. Yeah. I'm a fan of local yeah. food production. That's, I think the estimates are between 1% and 2% of the agriculture that's currently done in the state is done for local food production. So it's it's not, we, we probably shouldn't be focusing on that um, as, as where agriculture has to change because it's it's small and if it can be sustained it should be sustained but the the big sorts of agriculture the big diversion projects um, the groundwater pumping that has made this the type of agriculture we have within the state primarily alfalfa which is um, primarily done for these large dairy um, concentrated animal feedlot operations that that's the kind of thing that that I think is is hard to Hard to justify, you know, probably hard to imagine a definition under which that's sustainable. So when you say that uh, we're transporting water out of the state uh, with the dairy industry, what that means is we're transporting water in milk out of the transport and in the cheese and the butter. And the, um, so what, um, uh, I've been very interested in the dairy business for a long time because uh, if you drive on highway on, um, Interstate 10 south of Cruces, you understand what's go going on there, if only with your nose. There is so much uh, a, a waste, and, it, and it's wrecking groundwater. They can't even pr process it. I mean, they don't even have enough you know, land to fertilize. What? Um, how did we get into this spot where we become, a, well, almost a quasi-major dairy producer in the desert, in the middle of the desert? How did that happen to us? I think we're sixth or seventh largest dairy producing state in the country, and, and, and it's happening in other desert states as well. My understanding is that the industry has a preference for the arid conditions. Uh, we, we might think, why aren't these cows grazing in Bucolic, Pennsylvania, or Vermont, or yes. something like that? Yeah. But there, there's a preference if it went, because they're doing these really large um, farming operations, they, they're industrial farming right. um, operations, and there's a preference for the arid conditions. I think our lack of groundwater regulation um, has played a part in that because it, some states are more stringent in their protection of groundwater, and the state is not and, and is becoming um, less so, and so they're, 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 that's one of the things that played a role. There are federal tax um, policies and, and subsidies, that, farm policies that play a role, So they're, they're, but, it, but it's not unique to New Mexico. It's mm -hmm. happened in other arid states. And, and for those who do believe in local foods, um, you know, we, we'd probably want to see the, the dairies that maybe some of us remember in the state where we were even buying food, even buying milk that wasn't pasteurized and so on. And we've, we've got a few uh, places producing cheese that are at smaller scale and so on. But but the, the notion of this being um, a good state from which to export agricultural products is one that is an in, in export. That particular agricultural product is one that is questionable. But but this would be an example of something that I think really can't be said in, in, in the current discussion about water. And so much of the policy discussions, whether looking at the recent New Mexico First um, publication that they prepared or things that come, the state water plan, things that come out of this, there's an assumption of the status quo that we're going to, that, that our job within the state is to figure it out how to continue doing 
everything we're doing. So obviously water for municipalities, water for industrial uses to the degree we have it, water for these sorts of agricultural purposes, the very small amount of water that um, is being provided for endangered species and recreational purposes. And we all want to think that uh, there has to be a way in which life can continue as it has been. And, and I don't know how to make discontinuous uh, the, the discontinuous nature of the environment, uh, something that is attractive, something that has political benefit for anyone to talk about. But I think it has to be said, things are changing. And if, if we look forward, I said 100 years, but if we look forward 20 years, I think most people who know about the, the scientific areas involved in this would say things are going to be very different 20 years from now. And, and so it is, it's simply misleading to say we can keep doing more of the same if only we spend money to bring in, you know, to pipe water from Ute Lake and develop the Gila River and find some new source of water and desalinate brackish water and, you know, all the other things that are being talked about to avoid coming to, you no, know, we, we actually have a limited water supply. It's going to become more limited with groundwater mining, the groundwater mining that's occurred. We know it's going to become more limited in those ways. So the physical reality is something that we, we, we just, in, in the political policy processes, we haven't been can about the physical realities, we haven't um, we haven't wanted to take them in. So uh, this leads me to think that that uh, perhaps you have some some proposals uh, that you would like to make, and perhaps they're even uh, what might be called radical proposals. Could you uh, explain what those might be if you have them? Well, well, here's the place where I I would say that I think that maybe the most radical thing we need to do is democratize the conversation about water. And what happens now in New Mexico and in Ute Lake and the Gila River, the project there, there's a proposed um, a proposal before the Interstate Stream Commission, actually a proposal that was pushed by the state engineer and the Interstate Stream Commission to. Um, take federal money to create a some sort of diversion project on the Gila River or and and take water out of the Gila River and send it to some unknown people somewhere who will use it. It, it may maybe send it to Deming, maybe maybe there'll be more agricultural user no no one no one knows where it'll go, but the, the, the notion is that well we've got some federal money so we should do something. And and just the way that project came about to so to talk about who decides democracy, the way that project came about I think is instructive. The essentially someone in Senator Bingaman's office, Senator Bingaman, as the chair of a powerful committee, um, when Arizona came in and said we'd like something from the Congress, it was a good time for our delegation to say, well, okay, before we go too much further with this conversation, there's a little something we'd like from Arizona. We'd like to get back 12,000 acre feet of water and take more water out of the Gila River, and we'd like a little money with which to do it. So the, the, the Congress is in, or a senator is in on that conversation. The state engineer is in on that conversation from New Mexico, and the Bureau of Reclamation, the federal agency that would carry it out, is in on that conversation. Nobody else in the state was. It, it was just, I mean, I, I know this because we talked to Governor Richardson, and he wasn't aware of the proposal, after, despite the fact that it was being pushed by his state engineer. And and that's that's an example. Um, we, we were able to intervene in that um, because I, I, I happened to run into a friend who happened to be <laughs> representing the state on it, and he told me what he was up to, and we were able to get into Senator Bingaman's office and to come out with a deal under which if we don't build a big diversion project, we still get half the money, and we can use it on some sensible projects to actually do some good things for water in the area that would be um, served by that and protect the Gila River. But... Um, that that's an example of how we need to democratize. I mean, if if it's a good idea to do something by the Gila, uh, with the Gila River or with Ute Lake or any number of the other big projects that are being pushed in the state, those ideas should come up locally. But the more radical thing I'd have to say is that I don't think federal funding is particularly helpful, and 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 I don't want to make that to say ever in any circumstance with yeah. respect to water. But a lot of these harebrained ideas only make sense because someone else is paying for them. And so if the people in eastern New Mexico were asked, you've got a problem here, you're mining your groundwater, 
you know, you can look ahead and think 30 years from now, you're not going to have enough groundwater. What are you going to do about it? Well, they probably would do something about groundwater mining. And, you know, we've estimated that a, a very small reduction in groundwater mining at a fraction of the cost, the half a billion dollars of mostly federal money, would bring them uh, the same benefits. But if, if someone says, we can get you big federal dollars for this project, right. you don't have to pay for it. And if the engineering firm gets a cut of the big federal project rather than getting some, you know, there, there's not a cut when you conserve water or buy water users out, then, you know, we're all going to go for the big thing with our, the big, you know, bucks in our eyes about what can we do about this. So, so we, we need to democratize and we need to be responsible for actually paying for the solutions that make sense to a local community. What a terrible pickle we're in if, if uh, the democratization of water discussion is radical. You know, I mean, that, that seems to me to be a terrible place. It's also, um, there's a problem of language, too, which I'm beginning now to understand more and more. When we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about industrial agriculture. When we're talking about uh, uh, groundwater use, we're talking about massive, massive pullouts of water with, uh, with no hope of recharge by largely industrial-sized uh, agriculture cultural enterprises. We're not talking about local agriculture particularly. Uh, it's always been a kind of a, I guess, a, a misnomer that most agriculture in New Mexico is family-oriented and uh, ranches too. But I think it is in terms of raw numbers, but not in terms of money. Anyway, so, so um, do you have any more radical uh, ideas? Maybe I could say on democratization, yeah. it actually is working. In you know, I, I have been talking about the the big scale of what's yeah. going on in water management, and then if if we if we flip and and look to communities where um, there the, where the the river is almost dry, and therefore the acequias are almost dry, and and we can actually see examples in in acequias. We can see examples in other smaller scales where there is a conversation among stakeholders about what do we do about water shortages and and what kind of um, sensible decisions can we make in the light of those shortages. So I I wouldn't say that uh, I would say that the places where we have democracy functioning, where where we have that kind of civic conversation and participation, there are some some very good things happening in water management. So I, I didn't, I, I don't mean at all. I think we need to do it at the, at the big scale. We need Absolutely. to do it where uh, at the big scale of state water policy. I, I, th I think that the, um, the, the other thing I would put on the table, I once pursued this in, in the legislature, is the notion of a tax on the withdrawal of water. There could be a tax on the withdrawal. Now, now, if even you have your mouth dropping open, I, <laughs> I know are, I'm in trouble. My eyes are <laughs> and, and, I, and I think we got all of two votes in the one committee. But um, do remember that the, the water of the state does belong to the people of the state, and, and others have a you know you, you have a right to use water when you, when you have a permit, but you you don't own the water. And, and we do tax if if we look at groundwater at non renewable groundwater, we, we do tax the severance of minerals, coal, uranium oil and gas and so on and so the, you know we, we the, the notion that if you're taking something that belongs to the public and you're using it that you should pay something to the public treasury and and and, and for the purpose of which I'll go on to suggest that that might serve the public with respect to water I don't think it's really that radical um, because most water is owned in the state by those who have been using it the longest and that that would be the agricultural entities, the price paid for water is, is actually very low. I mean, if, if you're pumping your own groundwater, the, you, you might not pay anything except the cost of, of pumping. If you're getting water through an irrigation or conservancy district, the price paid for it is very low. And that influences a lot how people use water. It influences whether or not they conserve water. Um, it influences their, their interest in growing higher value crops, for example, and as compared to crops that don't require much labor. And so one of the things that California has done successfully is through, through all sorts of different mechanisms, but increase the 
cost, the, the, the price that's attached to water, and then seen some good things that come out of that. So, so a, a tax on the use, the, on the withdrawal of water, whether surface or groundwater, would in itself um, have a lot of good policy um, repercussions. And although, and, and it would indeed be, it was indeed considered radical and would indeed be considered radical. What I think we, we might consider doing with the revenues raised by that is to buy back the state interest in water. And, you know, some people, you know, we, we, we have this prior appropriation system. We live um, in a property rights regime. And um, countries that have had revolutions, like South Africa, said, well, we'll, we'll tear up prior appropriation. Um, but other countries, that have, such as Australia, that have a prior appropriation system, that have rights in water, um, in, in Australia, a large fund was created um, in, in which the, the government then went and purchased back from willing sellers, purchased back water rights. So once you've bought back those water rights, you've got choices. You can do more for protecting our rivers. You can try and restore our rivers. Um, you can avoid the need for some of these large water projects. You can auction off the water um, to those who have a use, for, you know, who, who think this in, in years where there's enough water to be auctioned off, you can auction off the water. And those who can make the best use of it in terms of economics can, can go out and bid for the water that year. And, and this is what's happening quite successfully in Australia, mm -hmm. you know, where the transition has really been made to saying, we can't, we don't have enough water. Their Murray Darling Basin was in trouble. They, they were losing um, a, a very valuable environmental resource, but they were also confronted. They had 10 years of drought and they were confronted with um, businesses, you know, with family farms and with farmers going out of business and so on. And so the notion was, let's, let's get a grasp on, a hold on what resources we have and then let's put those to those who can make the best use of them and, and the agricultural community. I certainly, it, it would be um, just lying to say that it's, it's been without lots of conflict. There's been lots and lots of conflict involved and, and lots of opposition to it. But they, they've made the transition to saying water's something that belongs to the public. And if you're going to use it, you're going to come in, bid on an auction basis, um, and put it to use for that period, make your economic plans, knowing how much water is available to you. It seems really like what we're talking about quite a bit here is uh, the differences between basically obsolete, inoperable, uh, incompetent, short-term thinking based on trend analysis and on the past, uh, as opposed to taking a visionary leap, uh, seeing what is probable ahead, and trying perhaps not to put your entire eggs in, in a little long-range basket, but certainly a lot more than we have, because we don't have a long-range plan, obviously. We see, we see New Mexico first, actually, I believe, advocating for uh, desalinization, which is a, you know, seemingly a long-term solution, but it's an old, old-fashioned thing uh, that I think is fraught with terrible environmental dangers with salt and other things. But so, um, so I, the classic example of the old short-term uh, way of thinking about things is what happens with groundwater pumping south of Elephant Butte and and along the Pecos. Um, and I know you have some ideas about that. Uh, I also love you to uh, uh, to get into a critique of of the, uh, of the of the state engineer and of and of the general wheels of of water mismanagement in New Mexico at the moment. I, I think that the our state approach is one of supply side, and I've I've likened this to energy. If if we told everybody in the state, you know, you you have a, a right to energy as much energy as you need, we'll find some way of getting it to you. And well, we don't, we don't do that with energy. We say, you know, if if you want to fill up your car, you're going to pay three fifty a gallon to fill up your car and you're going to have to figure out whether you fill up your car and take that trip or not. I mean, you know, that, that's going to be a decision you've got to make. But the, the time came when we, we realized that there, there's not going to be unlimited energy at a very low cost for everybody. It, it just, it can't happen and it can't happen for 
a whole, a whole number of different reasons. I think within in water policy, we're still saying, you know, we've got to find, there's a water shortage, there's not enough water to meet demand, so we've got to find more water. And we that is the path we're on, and it's building pipelines, you know, it's pumping the groundwater in the San Augustine Plains and delivering it somewhere, it's building a pipeline here, it's somewhere getting more water from some other state. I mean, even, even uh, Governor Richardson sort of stumbled into it, well, get the Great Lake you know somehow but somehow we're, we're gonna we're gonna do desalinization we're gonna do water reuse I mean you know nothing the matter with desalinization or water reuse but but they're very expensive and before we said we're gonna promise more water and enough, as much water as everybody says they need um, from somewhere the alternative would be to look at managing demand and so you know I've mentioned one way you manage demand it's if you you know if, if we had a tax on water and then the and the uh, proceeds went to the state from that you you would you would look very hard at how much water you you know or a lot harder than people are now at how much water you're using all of the talk that's been about conservation and about efficiency in water is about managing demand almost absent from the public policies of the state from the discussions in the state legislature. I was on the Water Trust Board and we set aside a I think it was 5% of all the funding that we did, which was quite substantial, 50, 60 million dollars a year, and 5% would go to so-called conservation projects. So we, we have not gotten to the notion that just the most fundamental thing we've got to understand is that the water supply is finite and it's decreasing because of climate change. We're going to have more demand for water because things are getting hotter, and we have mined groundwater resources. And so we have to do demand management. So how does that relate to the state engineer? We, we There was a piece of legislation um, a couple of years ago to say that the state engineer shouldn't have to be an engineer, that we, we actually should allow the person who manages water resources for the state to come from another background, you know, clearly someone who had had experience managing other types of resources would be perhaps well positioned to do that. I, I, not, engineers are certainly capable of thinking about that, but they, they I, I think in, in particular in our state, we have come from a supply side in, in which if, if there's a water problem, there's an engineering solution, not, for example, an economic solution. It seems really that with water demand, and, and I think the supply side analysis is totally right, um, but with water demand, with energy demand, um, uh, we're looking at a at a phasing into something. Although we could have a catastrophe and you know, suddenly be caught terribly short with nothing, uh, but we have to make a change into something else. Uh, and and uh, what that something else would be. I mean, it's I've been thinking about the arts and culture in 2050, 36 years away. Virtually impossible to do that. But 100 years from now, uh, it seems witheringly difficult. But still, you have to get from one place to another without destroying everything you have. What do you think are some 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 useful, probable, practical transitional moves we might make, say, to move from a supply side to a demand side of view of water? When I think about climate change, I try to think of other times in history when people could look ahead and could know, you know, how much the world was going to change, and then they would take steps to do something to prepare for that. And sadly, you know, of course, Jared Diamond in his book Collapse tells us that's quite rare that that happens. Um, that that, and, and it's it's really hard to think of other times. Sometimes people bring up the example of World War II, where I guess our parents' generation was part of this this transition in which they realized all of a sudden that things in, in their use of you know energy, food, all sorts of things had to change. The economy had to change. And there was a mobilization within the country and uh, preparation, you know, very rapid preparation and cha very rapid change for what was upon the country. And uh, we responded well with, as a nation to that. So th th that's the kind of mobilization that I think mm -hmm. has to take place place in, in with respect of course not just to water but but all the thing you know our, our use of energy the, the sorts of things we're using as supplies for energy our use of the land all of the things that environmental change are, are bringing really to us very rapidly and where incremental change 
might be taking us down the wrong path because something that makes sense for the next few years where we think, well, it's probably going to be the case that these reservoirs will have enough water in them and we can probably do a little more of this and a little more of that. But if, if, we, if we take our time frame out just somewhat further, we would say, no, we, we actually need to make changes of a different sort right now to prepare for what's coming. I, 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 what I would think, as I said, we, we, we should do is consider um, talking to those who were in agriculture and thinking about the kinds of economic mechanisms that it would make it possible for trans transactions to occur that make economic sense for those who are in the business and 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 you know agriculturalists are intelligent people the, the those who were dealing with grazing for example are you know even much less protected than those who were using water resources directly and so they're thinking about those transitions and what needs to happen i think it it's almost seems to me like some there's some chess beating by governmental entities and maybe by some of the agricultural organizations to say no things will stay the same and you know that 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 rancher in Nevada running his right. cattle you know no you know we're we're in a different time you can't do it as you've done it before the 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 forage simply isn't there so so what are the kinds of steps that make sense to the individual to the community within which the individual operates to say we know change is coming and it's actually not helpful to have government whether that's and, and you know I think it's a elected officials and, and others and, and those who work for the big agencies to say, no, you know, do more of the same, stay in there, we'll protect you somehow. It, it would actually be better for them to get, you know, to be candid about what we understand about our changing environment. If you just take a look at the seven states in the Colorado Compact, and they're all suffering terribly, terribly, terribly from drought, their, uh, uh, their situation of demand is astronomically enormous. Um, a little state like us, who you know is facing Texas with what a hundred million dollar bank roll now to attack us over the Rio Grande and other things. Uh, what 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 would making important long range changes do to our leveraging capacity in the struggle? I believe the water struggle with other states in the future. Would that bring us an advantage? Would we have some leg up in, say, the competition for uh, the Colorado River? I mean, we all know that, that Nevada almost destroyed the Colorado River Compact because it wanted its water, and it would have. And it, it would be like, you know, wrecking Yugoslavia or something. You know, we'd have, a, you know, a terrible balkanized stuff, and we'd be in the hole. Uh, but so I guess the long range, I would think that, long-range thinking would give us a leg up. I'm not sure what kind, however. The compacts, I, you know, the, the compacts are what we, we think of, you know, so much controlling our major rivers and our required water deliveries. And, and the Pecos might be an example where it takes a whole lot of effort within New Mexico to get some water to Texas. And the water may not have as much value in Texas as it does in New Mexico, and, and, I, and I, economic value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, it, 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 we could be exploring economic solutions in which we sit down with Texas and we think, okay, here's the amount of water we owe you, but here's the amount of money it's costing us to deliver that water, money in terms of the agricultural interests on the Pecos River. Is there a point between <laughs> what it costs us and what it's worth to you at which we might settle and from and and go forward and and so you know i think every water lawyer everybody in the water business would say we can't ever change the compacts but arizona and the actions that have been taken on the colorado river are an example of where the state said we, we kind of have to change the compact. We don't want to open up the compact, so we're not going to change the compact. But we're going to do some things, which to a Martian or someone from another state, but that might look like they've actually changed the compact. But they, they've come out with some 
approaches that are reasonable. They're, they're not going to solve everything for the Colorado River, but in the short term, they came out with a shortage sharing agreement right. on the Colorado River right. that said we can go forward, and it reflected, you know, Nevada's enormous economic need for that water, and and the need of California and, and the sort of the different interests that are up and down there. So I think if we, you know, and and of course if we looked at the lower Rio Grande, um, we we actually there was an agreement with the uh, the New Mexico interests below Elephant Butte and the Texas interests and the question then that that agreement was one that the attorney general has said didn't adequately protect the interests of the state but but there was actually a functioning agreement so I I I would think you know in in teaching law we we learned that almost all civil litigation is settled through negotiations and it seems like we haven't really, you know, we, we've had some standing on principle where maybe we could reach some solutions that, that reflect the needs of the different parties that, that don't give everybody everything they want, but but actually will we'll get us to a position where everybody's a little better off. Um, so do, do we, does, does New Mexico end up, I, it, it is the fear of New Mexicans, I think it's the fear of every region that we're going to lose water yeah. and we're going to lose resources to other better funded states and so on. Um, there, when I look at the, the lower part of the Rio Grande within New Mexico and look at Texas and look at Mexico, we could, of course, instead look at it as a region the Paso del Norte and ask what is it that that region, you know, what makes sense for the region as a whole, the state boundaries and the national boundary down there maybe are not the most important thing in terms of what makes sense for the region as a whole, but we've, um, I, I, could we say the legal profession is particularly guilty of wanting to take the um, stances that are based on these based on these boundaries and, and maybe been less creative, well, I shouldn't say maybe, and we've been less creative than we should be in, in thinking about problem solving for a region rather than what the state's right is to keep water from flowing down to another state and so on. It's been a wonderful interview. You've just given me so much to think about. And, and, uh, and I know our viewers are going to be fascinated by this. The whole thought of a of looking at a water region instead of a potential war between states is liberating. It's a wonderful idea. So thank you so much for being here. And I hope in the future when we get into some innocent pickles with water, perhaps we could call upon you again and we could, we could talk this over some more. It's great fun to be here and to talk with you about water. And I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation in the pages Lovely. of the Mercury. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>